Hi everyone, I'm Dale Smith, aka Journo Dale, and we're here to talk about Canadian politics. There's been some interesting talk in the last week about broken promises, and in particular about the promise to end boil water advisories on all First Nations by March of 2021. Now, this last week, the Minister of Indigenous Services came out and said that they weren't going to be able to meet the deadline for all of them. Uh, I think he said there will be about 12 left by the time March rolls around. Uh, but that's caused uh, a number of discussions around both the value of making ambitious promises and um, whether or not the government should have done that, or I guess the Liberals should have done that even before they formed government. Um, there's a few things I just kind of thought we should talk about that and unpack that a little bit, because I think it's an interesting discussion to have when we talk about the value of promises in politics. Um, and the first thing I think I would say is that um, a broken promise is not necessarily a lie. I, I get that a lot in some of the fact checking I do and I get people pushing back and say that, oh, the liberals broke this promise, so they are liars too. But there's a difference between a lie and a broken promise in that a promise can be a lie if you had no intention of going through with it in the first place, kind of like conservatives and environmental targets. Um, whereas the Liberals made this promise, they put in a lot of money and effort into fulfilling it and just weren't able to cross the finish line in time. Um, does that mean that the value there was no value in doing it? So no. Um, I think there's incredible value in their deciding to finally take responsibility for this problem and deal with it and put in the resources and time um, and capacity in order to come up with lasting solutions for it. But the fact that they didn't make it in time, I don't think invalidates the promise or, and I really don't think it means that they didn't try hard enough because I do think that they did. I think the bigger problem that we're facing here is the communication around both the scope of the problem and the timelines for solutions. Um, one of the things that I, I seem to come across a lot is people kind of encountering this notion that um, this particular boil water problem is somehow, um, you, you know, we, we often hear that, well, if this happened in Toronto, people would be up in arms and so on. Part of the problem is the way in which we envision this. Um, this wouldn't happen in Toronto necessarily because Toronto's situated in a place where it's there is easy access to the kinds of things that it takes to fix that problem. Whereas that's not really the case in a lot of these First Nations, which are remote or fly-in communities. Um, and that plays a big part in why the, the problem came to be a problem in the first place and why solutions can be so hard to come to. And I don't think that we necessarily got enough candor from the government in explaining what the problems were and why the solutions are difficult. Um, one of the things that once you look into this a little bit, it becomes quickly apparent is that no two boil water advisories are the same. No two First Nations first, uh, fresh water or drinking water problems are the same. They're all different, they're all unique, and that makes it much more difficult to come up with solutions, uh, particularly when you only have so much staff and, and so, um, so much capacity in your organization in which to solve these. And, um, I don't think that's necessarily been discussed adequately, either on the government side or in the media. I mean, the media does occasionally put stories out that explains the situation, but they, they're fre infrequent and not necessarily referenced very effectively when it comes to some of the problems. Um, we had a lot of reporting in the last few weeks about a particular First Nation in Northern Ontario called Nishtanga which has been under boil water advisories for decades, um, and they had to evacuate because of new problems. It wasn't until you get to the very bottom of most of the stories that it you actually realize that they have built a new water treatment plant, it's nearly completed construction, 
Um, these, these problems have cropped up in spite of that. Um, but there's been like the, the rest of the story, all of the, you know, 10 or 12 paragraphs above that, um, nobody says that, you know, the government has been working on it. They have spent millions of dollars. The, they have been, uh, working to build this new plant. Um, so I think there's a bit of a disconnect in, in how we're framing these, uh, problems and these stories when they come up and we're, we're relying on certain narratives that we as media sometimes tend to reinforce whether consciously or not. Um, and I think that's partially why the public doesn't get an, a good understanding as to what these boil water advisory problems are and what some of the solutions are. Um, some of the things we need to think about, which the government has not been very good about explaining, is, for example, in some of these communities that are remote or fly in, uh, you might have an ice road that you can deliver supplies uh, up for one or two, you know, two, maybe three months of the year. But because of climate change, we now have situations where ice roads are becoming uh, less stable and, uh, you know, that hold for much shorter windows. So you can't get a lot of supplies up uh, the way you can in other parts of the country. That's incredibly important context to have for some of these kinds of situations. And if they're not communicated properly, people are left with the impression that nothing's being done or um, that it's a different problem entirely. I, I can't tell you how many times I see tweets about, we can build pipelines for oil, but not to get water to First Nations. And it's not a pipeline of fresh water issue. It's there's water there, it needs to be treated. Um, but that's the issue. The treatment plant is either failing or the infrastructure of getting pipe, you know, the piping for the uh, treatment plant to the houses is, is failing or there's a problem with the reservoir or something. Those are all different kinds of problems. Other problems are capacity in the community. Um, I've read a number of stories that the community gets someone who can tr be trained to maintain the system once it's operational. Uh, and as soon as they get them trained up, they get a better offer from another community and they end up taking off because it's a lot more money. Um, and that happens repeatedly in some communities and that's why their systems end up failing again is because they have no ability to maintain them. Uh, again, these are stories that aren't necessarily being explained and which, you know, unless they're uh, explained a lot more and repeated in people's minds, they don't get the notion that, you know, this is, this is what some of the problems are. It's not a, it's not a mechanical issue. Um, to a certain extent, it can be a money issue, but it's also a, you know, um, a, a capacity issue. And I don't know that we necessarily have that conversation often enough. So all of this to, to kind of bring it back to the fact that um, when it comes to a broken promise like this, I think it's incumbent upon government to have candor to explain why things didn't get done properly, um, why timelines weren't met. Uh, and we don't get a lot of that. We got a little bit from Minister Miller, who I will give him credit is much better about candor than most of his uh, colleagues in cabinet. Um, and he did also talk about things like uh, underestimating the extent to which some system, some water systems in some First Nations uh, had degraded uh, under previous governments. Um, and, you know, he did talk a little bit about some of the climate change. The pandemic has slowed down some uh, communities' situations because um, they couldn't get workers up there because they were closed in fear of anyone bringing in um, the COVID. So these are all things that needed to be communicated and needed to be communicated effectively. Just saying, um, we know this is a problem we're, and we promise to do better is not effective communication. It's just a platitude and it's just kind of a pat on the head. And that's really not what people need when it comes to both evaluating the situation and evaluating the response to the situation. I mean, we, the voters, are supposed to be able to hold the government to account, and it would be helpful if the government could tell us what they're actually doing so that we could do so. Um, this kind of goes along with the lines of transparency, and 
candor is a part of that transparency. Um, and, and I think we need to think about this with other kind of promises they're making. Um, climate change is, is another good example where um, I don't know if we're necessarily getting enough candor from the government in terms of all of their plans. We keep getting assurances that they are going to um, come up with a new framework. Uh, they've got the, the accountability legislation before them right now, but there are some holes in that, which uh, I'm writing a piece on for another outlet uh, currently, so keep an eye out for that. Um, but again, it's it's candor, it's transparency, and it's it's communicating effectively so that we understand what the problem is and what the solutions are and so that we can come up with judgments and solutions and, and so on based on what they're doing and communicating what they're doing. Um, this government, as I often like to, to point out, relies on, you know, these kind of happy, clappy talking points about, um, I, you know, um, no relationship is more important than that with First Nations. Okay, great, but that's not telling us what the problem is. That's not telling us what the solution is. That's not telling us what kind of progress you're making on the solution. Um, or what the problems are in getting there so that, you know, we can adjust expectations, but also, you know, judge the government's actions fairly. Um, and I think that's important. So all of this to say, um, promises are still important. Ambitious promises are still important, but we need to have better communication around what they are so that we can judge them effectively and not just kind of retreat into this cynical sense of all governments are liars, all promises are broken, so on and so on. Um, that's not helpful for anyone, and that's why I think candor is really the best route. And that's everything for this week. Join us again next week for some more Canadian politics. I'm Dale Smith, that's at journo underscore Dale on Twitter. And don't forget to like the video, share, subscribe, and support us on Patreon. Thanks everyone.